Welcome to the podcast, She is Fab, where we discuss all things fab, women empowerment, and life coaching. My name is Evelyn, also known as the Fab Chief Desk, and I am a mindset transformation coach. Welcome to another episode of the She is Fab podcast. My name is Evelyn, your host, mindset transformation coach. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Marty McEwen. She is a professional counselor and coach who has developed a specific technique for immediate emotional well being and ongoing personal development called the rapid relief process. She teaches the method in her free online class, Rapid Relief from Stress and Distress, and uses the rapid relief process as a key part of her stage fright cure. Welcome, Marty. Thank you so much, Evelyn. It's so nice to be here. I'm so glad to have you and so excited for what you can teach us and the wisdom that you'll be able to share. So tell us more about you and how you came across developing this process. Yes. Well, you know, like a lot of these things, it comes about with personal experience and personal need, right? I, uh, I've been a therapist for more than, 30, more than 30 years, and I've worked with people with depression and anxiety and self-esteem issues, relationship issues, you name it, all over the board. But, you know, about 15 years ago, I decided I wanted to learn to sing just for fun. I just wanted to be a singer. I thought that sounded really cool. So I booked my vo first voice lesson and much to my surprise and much to the shock of my teacher, I completely had a panic attack, meltdown, I froze. As soon as she said, sing me something, as soon as I was standing up in front of her and I was being asked to sing for someone else's uh, evaluation at that moment, right? I mean, usually we sing for other people's enjoyment, but at that mm -hmm. point it was for her evaluation. I completely froze. I had no idea where it came from, why that had come over me. And uh, it was just miserable. It was just miserable. I, I started to squeak out a sound, but that's where I started with my singing. And every three months or so, she would have us get up, her students, get up in front of about 50 people, friends and family, in a kind of dinner theater style thing. And every single time I was shaking in my boots, my heart would race, my hands would be sweaty. And, and I was absolutely miserable. It was, it was terrifying. I wanted to do it, but it was terrifying to me. I had no idea why. So at the same time, about the same time, I had been using some techniques that, uh, that are now under the umbrella of what's called energy psychology. And they're extremely good techniques for phobias, for anxiety, for post-traumatic stress disorder, for uh, anger issues, anything that's an arousal, you know, and a want to, an unwanted arousal in your system. Well, that's certainly what I was going through. So I thought, well, why don't I take these techniques and apply them to myself and see what happens? So I sat myself down in my own little office <laughs> on my own little couch <laughs> and I applied these techniques to my fear of singing, specifically to my fear of singing and kind of asking myself, where did this come from? What is this all about that singing in front of people would be so scary to me? And my mind immediately went back to a fourth grade embarrassing incident that had happened to me. I, I had slipped on my new shoes on the freshly waxed floor in front of the whole classroom and they all laughed and I just felt foolish. You know, I felt embarrassed. I felt like, like I was a, the brunt of the joke, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I realized sitting there in my office that that was kind of the same feeling I had when I got up to sing in front of people. Like they're going to laugh at me, right? They're going to they're gonna think I'm foolish for being up there even pretending that I can sing. Uh, and and I, it was really clear to me that there was a parallel there. So I used those same energy psychology techniques that I've been using with my clients in the office to clear up that old icky memory. You know, we all have those old icky memories of things that happened that still when we think about them, we go, oh God, that, you know. Well, I cleared it up until I just, it just didn't matter anymore. That memory didn't matter anymore. Now, I didn't have any idea whether that was going to translate into the next time I got up to sing in front of people, except that it did. I was about half nervous. 
I, my heart was racing about half as fast, you know, I was half as worried. And I thought, wow, that's really something. So I started to dismantle my own stage fright, my fear of singing, using these techniques and kind of introspecting about what things had happened to me in my previous life that would have translated into singing in front of people being something I didn't want to do. Like, there was one time when my dad said to me, don't sing so loud when we were all singing like Christmas carols around the piano or something, you know, little, little things that are not like terribly awful, but just kind of contributed to this startle response about being up in front of people and singing. So gradually, of course, of course, when you're more relaxed, you're a better singer too. And I continued to take voice lessons. It wasn't like I all of a sudden was a wonderful singer, but, it, but, the more relaxed I was, the better I sang. And the better I sang, the more confidence I had in my singing and that I could relax some more. And then if I came up with something else that I thought was, uh, that I was uh, holding in my system that would get in the way of my comfort to sing in front of people, I would use those same techniques to clear that up. So then I thought, well, what if, it, if this worked so well for me, why wouldn't it work equally well for other people? So I started with my clients who had any kind of performing issues like speaking or singing or interviews or auditions or or musicians or or you know you name it and started to see the the the, the commonalities underneath everybody's story now everybody's story is different and everybody's situation and what they want what it is that they want to do in front of other people is different but the principle of the thing and the techniques that work are the same across the board. And so that's where the stage fright cure came from. And then I sat down and when writing the book, I had to figure out, you know, how am I going to package this so that people can take advantage of it? And that that's where the, that's where the, uh, the structure and the format of the stage fright cure came from. But I got to tell you, it's, it's, I don't have any fear of singing anymore, which is wonderful. Um, and a lot of my clients over the years don't have any fear of whatever they came with me, came to me with the uh, fear of. So it's very That's gratifying. Amazing. Yeah, it's very gratifying. Because you would think that it would still exist in some way, shape or form, even if it's a, a small fear. I have heard it said that uh, when it comes to any sort of performance, whether it's public speaking or singing or playing an instrument, that if you lack any sort of nervousness or fear that you're going to bomb or that that feeling is actually a positive and not a negative. Have you heard that said? I've heard it and I don't believe it for a minute. I really don't. <laughs> In the book, I, I have three stages. That's stage fright and stage uh, freedom, which means lack of fear. Mm -hmm. And flight which is excitement it which is oh boy here we go I'm gonna nail this one you know that kind of uh I can't wait to get up and tell my story or I can't wait to get up and play my instrument or I can't wait to get up and sing or do whatever it is and then in the middle there is stage apathy I was I, I tell the story about uh going to a stage play with a very famous actor in it and uh, he was playing a king. I don't remember exactly that. I, maybe it was King Lear. I don't remember. But anyway, he was playing this king and he was marching off the stage and, you know, with this big costume and his flowing robes and his crown and he's marching off the stage. And before he gets to the wings, he goes, huh, and, wa <laughs> and walks <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> you know, he's completely out of character. Well, that man had probably done that role, you know, hundreds of times. And, and I was really disappointed because he dropped that energy. Mm. You know? and, and so what I say is you need energy. You definitely need energy to do your best at anything and especially performing, but you don't need fear. You don't need fear. fear because what fear does that fight, flight or freeze response that gets triggered in the middle of your brain and, 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 uh, and sends a message to your adrenal glands to shoot all that adrenaline through your system in a negative way, right? Like that's an oh no response. 
that gets in the way of your performing. So That's I'm adamant to your performing. I'm curious because what I've found too uh, is that some individuals may be really comfortable with public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on their career as well. But they might try something like singing, which is a little bit different. And then there mm -hmm. they have this fear or this nervousness. Have you experienced that with your clients where they're good in one area and not Absolutely. so good in the other? Absolutely. You hit it nail on the head. I, I've done public speaking most of my life. Maybe I'm a little bit nervous, kind of revved up, you know, for public speaking. And I and I do remember in, in public speaking, I would have kind of an aftermath, like, oh, God, I hope I did okay, you know, that kind of thing. But the singing was the place where it just flared up out of the blue. So every client, you know, just to reinforce what you're saying, every client that I ever talked to they say, it's just the weirdest thing. I can get up in front of 10 people, but give me 13 people and I'm a mess. I can get up in front of my friends, but I can't get up in front of my boss, right? I can play an instrument all day long, but if I have to give a report in front of my team, it, it's so different, one person to the next. And I think the reason for that is, and, and it partly it came from my own you know, introspection, the reason for that is, is that the associations people have with different circumstances are different, right? Mm. I had associations. I know I had associations in my own mind as thinking of myself as somebody who would dare to be as cool as to be a singer, <laughs> right? I, I mean, being a public speaker, giving a report in school, that's academic. I know how mm -hmm. to do that stuff. That's no problem. But to get up and be cool and be a singer, now that was you know out of myself uh out of my self-concept and so for what you're saying some people who are afraid of doing one thing than another or are afraid in some circumstances versus other circumstances as irrational as it seems we always figure out what the elements are in the situations that trigger fear and why that particular situation would trigger fear for that particular person. Yeah, that is so interesting. And, and it's almost like a contradiction, right? Because you are in some capacity doing a similar act, but because they're different in terms of the output, you're mm -hmm. you have this feeling of fear or nervousness. Uh, something that it's you mentioned, the, it's actually to the input, because uh, it's what you perceive the situation to be. It's what your ah. perceptual system is taking in and then making that mean something, mm -hmm. right? Here's, a, here's another story that's kind of fun. A friend of mine who is a wonderful singer, um, she, whenever she get up to sing, she would either sit on a stool or lean on the piano. And it was, mm -hmm. and she was just as comfortable as anything. She's been singing since she was a teenager. She was wonderful. Everybody loved her, everything like that. She, I saw her in another setting where she had to, she was a part of a, of a seminar. She was teaching part of a seminar and she was standing up in, in the middle of what was, it was, it's not a raised stage, but it was, she was standing in the middle of the, in front of the crowd and you could just see her start to freeze. She just started going like this, you know, and her eyes started getting big and she just, oh, oh. She could just feel you and everybody's looking at her like, uh oh, and, and so she turned around and she saw a stool over off to one side. She went over and she got the stool. She sat down on the stool and everything was fine because oh, she wow. had, she had that stool, the sitting down. She had that so associated with her comfort in singing that she gave herself the same, she didn't know she was doing it, but she gave herself the same circumstances that made her feel comfortable instead of circumstances that made her feel like all exposed and, and uh, you know, and insecure. That That's funny? interesting. Yeah, she wasn't, you know, maybe consciously aware of what she was doing, no. but something she was like, she recognized, okay, the stool, my, my usual behavior or environment and she did it, and that helped to relax her yeah. to do what she had to do. Yeah, she didn't um, even, I even the one who told her that happened. She didn't even remember that it happened. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it well, was perfect. 
Well, something else that you had mentioned, uh, which people don't always think on or take into consideration, was the fact that you, in the moment where you were about to sing and you had this freeze happen, you thought about an occurrence in your childhood where you were told not to sing so loud and you wouldn't think that that would have any sort of impact. But these things do, especially as they happen throughout your life. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. I didn't have that thought in the moment when I was freezing like that. I didn't have any thought then. But it was later on. Mm -hmm. It for I just asked myself, well, what am I? What is this like? What is this similar to in my memory, in my history? And it, and as I said, it doesn't have to be terribly serious. But it was a kind of startle moment, and um, gave me to believe that I didn't sound good. Nobody would want to hear me. Right. And so, and that I, and that I should, I should stifle, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. so, so I did. And uh, it wasn't until years and years later, I mean, I didn't even remember that part of it. It wasn't until years and years later that I made that connection because I didn't need to. It was a subconscious connection that was living in there the whole time that didn't get activated, if you will, until the circumstances presented themselves. I think it's amazing how that happens. You know, you have been in therapy for years. So how you engage with clients is a little bit different than how like a coach or a counselor might. Uh, I, I would say you have more power because of your education and, and the work that you do. But a lot of folks don't realize or access memories or instances that have impacted them until the need arises, whether they're working through something or trying to achieve a certain goal. And with a professional, especially if you're working with a professional, they're able to pull things out of you that you might have buried so deeply subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, I think we know things about ourselves inside if we stop and we look inside and kind of go, hmm, you know, that's kind of like that other thing. Mm -hmm. The problem <laughs> just, is we don't do, we don't do the, the self work and, and the we, self uh, analyzing. <laughs> We don't usually sit down and like take the time to allow things to come to the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, when we ask ourselves a question like, where did that come from? You know, where did that come from? Most of the people that come to me for any kind of performance anxiety or, or fear of speaking or performing, uh, they have a hunch somewhere inside. They have a hunch. Maybe it came from some cultural taboos like, like you're not supposed to brag on yourself in some cultures. Mm -hmm. So when people start to get up and express themselves or to, to um, show their knowledge or show their skill or show their talent, there's a pushback on that culturally. It's like, it's not like we're hearing voices, but it is like those influences of those voices. Like now, honey, don't be too full of yourself. You know, that those kinds of, infinite number of voices that tell us we shouldn't just go for it if you mm -hmm. know what i mean um, that's a good point i mean a lot of oh. folks you have your experiences right you're that you're going through as you're developing and growing you have mm -hmm. your cultural norms the environment you know what your family taught mm -hmm. you and then societal norms all these things in some way compound or can limit you in an area that's right a lot of people who come to me were bullied in some way mm. or made fun of. Um, one fellow I remember years ago, a client of mine had been going to a Montessori school in his youth, and then they had to move somewhere and he went to a Catholic school. Well, Montessori schools and Catholic schools are very different. And in the Montessori school, he was just very outgoing and gregarious and he did what he wanted and nobody bothered him. You know, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a problem for him to act independently and express himself and be silly and make jokes. So he went to the Catholic school where all that stuff is not cool. You don't do that. Mm. So he uh, remembered an incident where the teacher, I don't remember whether it was a nun or who, what kind of, but the teacher just sharply just brought him up to the front of the class and made fun of him in front of his, the rest of his, the class. Cause he was talking in class. He was, you know, he wasn't staying in his seat and he was doing what he knew to do in this other culture. It wasn't mm -hmm. like national culture. It was a school culture. And all of a sudden he was in a place where those things were not allowed. 
And it, that was one of the big factors that, uh, that and, and funnily enough, that guy, uh, his, the circumstances where he got nervous were in front of his friends. Mm. Not, the, he wasn't nervous in front of the boss or anything. He was, he was nervous when the, his friends were out there. Now get the, do you see the parallel? Yeah. It's like he was, he was trying to make friends at this new school and he had this embarrassing moment in front of those, his friends. And he, that translated to him having this involuntary fear response whenever he was up standing up in front of his friends. And his coworkers were like his friends. So he uncharacteristically would just like freeze when he had to get up and, you know, present at a, at a meeting with his coworkers. It's very fascinating. That, no, it, it is. And when you think about the behaviors and, and the different scenarios and environments and how you perform in each, mm -hmm. right. And the feelings that it brings up, um, I did want to ask, so part of that whole freeze, flight or flight that we all have engendered in us, that mm -hmm. obviously brings up stress, whether you acknowledge it or not, there's more of an impact that over time can also affect your health. I know you also work uh, in that capacity. Yes, yes. And s stress is, in fact, uh, either, uh, either a um, chronic over time heightened cortisol and adrenaline level or a spike, right? So uh, stress in my personal interpretation of it is that constant heightened feeling of urgency, right? We're, we're so busy. We're, we're, there's a deadline. There's always a deadline. There's this, there's that, there's, you know, arguments at home. There's this, all the stuff that's going on is that has you in a kind of heightened state. And then distress is when something happens that's upsetting and it's more uh, acute and it's more, it's more um, hitched to some particular thing, right? So the class that I teach is rapid relief from stress and distress. And what I've done is, well, a colleague of mine, Stephanie Elbringhoff was also a therapist and a friend and a colleague. We put together a, a seven step protocol, if you will, it's a, it's like a, it's like energy exercises that you do while you're noticing your stress or distress level. And by increments, after we do each one of those routines, I'll call them people's stress level or distress level about whatever they're working on in the moment, whatever they're targeting with their attention goes down and down and down to the point where at the end of the class, the thing that was bothering them so much at the beginning of the class is like way down in their uh, arousal, you know, in their upset mm -hmm. level. Uh, it happens every single time. I've, I've been teaching this class for years and have more than 200 people have, have they, I have people in the class give me feedback after each of the exercises as to, okay, now how intense is it now? And what does it feel like? And how is it intense is it now? And, and it just goes down and down and down. And uh, it's, it's so exciting because it, when we're upset or we're stressed, we handle things not as well, right? As mm -hmm. we, as we do when we're more relaxed and, and not as bothered by things. So it affects people's lives really profoundly. Oh, definitely. Like you mentioned earlier with your singing, right? Uh, you're more relaxed when you're comfortable, which allows you to project your voice a lot better, to have better tone, whereas where you're nervous and, and have that fear, you perform uh, not well. <laughs> not um, well. <laughs> but um, I wanted to... Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask because, uh, you know, I've been a part of plenty of speaking engagements and, you know, both for my own experience and the experience of others, they advise you that when you're speaking publicly, if you have any sort of nerve to imagine the audience naked or <laughs> to hold your hands a certain way, all these little sort of tricks to help you to relax a bit more. I find that that doesn't always work. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> So is there anything that you uh, could share that the audience could, but could apply in their day to day? <laughs> yeah, but me, I can definitely, I have to tell you a story though, about <laughs> audience in their underwear. 
uh, no, I, I've never heard that to work. I never heard that to work. One time I was, uh, I was a young therapist and there was this very famous therapist, a woman teaching the seminar and where there was a whole, like 200, two, two or 300 other therapists in the room. And, and she, she asked a question and I raised my hand and I answered it from the audience, right? I must have been, I don't know, my late twenties or something, early thirties. And she, anyway, she, she thought my answer was pretty good. So she invited me up on the stage to say it to the, you know, to the, to the rest of these seasoned 300 other therapists. Mm -hmm. And this woman was very tall. So, you know, my head was like under her armpit (laughs) and, and she said, Oh, are you nervous? I said, "Uh uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> she put her arm around me like this, you know, she, like under, I, I'm under here. And you're she under her, her armpit. <laughs> her armpit. She, she said, I have a cure. I said, oh, good. She said, imagine them all in their underwear. <laughs> well, I looked out over the audience and, and all I could see was about two or 300 people being embarrassed because they were imagining me imagining them <laughs> in their underwear and, I, it, and, I, and it didn't help of course but she let she she looked down very hopefully and said doesn't that help mm-hmm. and I, I went oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't it, it didn't at all anyway um you asked if there were some tricks there are many but One of the things about the energy psychology techniques is to stimulate acupuncture points in a certain way. It's not like tapping, you know, a lot of people have heard of tapping Mm -hmm. and that's a particular kind of protocol. This is, this is related to it, but it's different. And, uh, what people can do not on stage (laughs) (laughs) is to put some vibration into this point right here right under your, right in front of your pupils, right under your eyes and under your armpits, right on the side and then under your collarbones, just like this. And then take your wrists and put them together and lay them, keep your, the inside of your wrist together and lay them on your waistline or belly or wherever it lands. And then breathe as though you're blowing up a balloon in your, in your uh, viscera, if you will. You're blowing up a balloon in your tummy and then letting it out really slowly, right? Mm-hmm. And that that little short routine may very well slow your heart rate, get you grounded, right? So that you don't feel so spinning out. Bring your energy down into your body and get you grounded. Now, is that going to cure your stage fright? Probably not. It's probably more complicated than that. But that's one little trick you could try to see if it could help in the moment. That's great. And for those of you that are listening and not watching, go to the YouTube because she's actually showing the the pressure points and what to do if you want to see that in action. Well, and um, if people don't want to tap, you can rub those points little in little circles instead. You could even just hold those points. It's just a matter of putting some vibration into those acupuncture points that will have a kind of a calming and relaxing effect. I'm definitely going to remember and practice that because, you know, even though I have a lot of public speaking engagements, I still get, you know, a little butterflies, a little nervous, depending on, on what it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah. one thing I wanted to ask too is regarding imposter syndrome, because uh-huh. I feel that when you are engaging, either teaching or speaking to a group that is comprised of your peers or other professionals, you might experience imposter syndrome because you think they might know more or they might be judging you and your content. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I think, you know, in a way I talk about my singing as being a stage fright, which of course it was, but it was also kind of a form of imposter syndrome because I had the idea that you had to be a certain kind of a person in order to be a singer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I was that kind of person, but there I was putting myself over as a singer right? Or a singer wannabe anyway. And, and so that was that conflict inside between who we think we really are, and what we're, who we, who we think we need to be in order to do the thing we're doing. That's the conflict. I mean, 
I'm sure there are other ways to talk about imposter syndrome, but that's one way. If there's a conflict between who I think I am and who I think I need to be in order to do the thing that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. One of the guys, I, uh, one man I worked with a couple years ago, two or three years ago, was a very high level executive uh, in a very large global corporation. And he was being called upon to do some speaking in front of thousands of people. And he, he himself uh, described his fear as evidence of imposter syndrome. And what we kind of came down to was that he was just this laid back, lanky, nice guy, you know, and he had just been really good at his job and he just kept getting promoted and promoted and promoted and promoted. And then he found himself in this uh, CMO position for this global corporation having to do all these. And so he thought that he needed to be hot stuff. You know, he mm -hmm. thought he needed to be, what's his name? <laughs> What's his name? You know, the motivational speaker guy. He he needed to be. Um, oh, I can't even remember his name right now. I, you know, I'm there. Right. There's so many. <laughs> so many. Right. Like he, someone like Tony Robbins or. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. He thought he needed to be this, you know, ta da kind of a guy and he had to do this thing. And, and it wasn't anywhere in his personality to be like that. So part of him getting out of this imposter syndrome was finding a way to do the thing that he was being called upon to do, but do it as himself. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about people who are maybe making a presentation in front of friends who know more about you than maybe you wish they did, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, there, but there's a way you can mentally separate those parts of yourself with the part of you that's perfectly competent in getting up and presenting information that has nothing to do with whatever this other thing might be. Mm -hmm. So finding mm -hmm. ways to reconcile that conflict uh, is, is the path to go as far as imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I find that a, a lot of times too, we're our biggest critic, our biggest judge. We we're so concerned with the perception of the mm -hmm. outside world that we actually uh, make it more complex and convoluted. Uh, instead of just accepting the simplicity of it, accepting the present moment awareness and what you're doing and, and being confident in that authority. But no, we find every which reason to focus on the negative, to sort of compound that fear, that nervousness, that imposter syndrome. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Because in the final analysis, doing it, what you're actually doing is likely not very complicated or is not not very is not outside of your capabilities right but you start to get not you individually but we we all um, start to turn it into a performance mm -hmm. and as soon as we start to turn it into a performance then there's evaluation coming at us then we get all hooked up in the evaluation that's, I think, what you're talking about, right? And then yes. we're all worried about how we're coming across or if we're going to remember the next thing to say or if we're going to look like a fool or whatever it is. And then we're then we're really caught up in the wrong focus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I am always surprised um, because, as you mentioned earlier, in some cultures or even the norms that you've grown up with, you, bragging or any sort mm -hmm. of uh, form of bragging or what could appear as bragging is frowned upon. So for a long time, I struggled with, you know, putting myself out there because I felt like it was a form of bragging. And even when folks offer compliments or kudos on uh, some engagement or work or interaction that I have, I'm like, oh, like, thank you so much. It's not the first thing I think about. So mm -hmm. even, you know, as a mindset coach, I still struggle with some of that because I'm only human. That's right. That's right. And besides which, if you don't have full permission to shine, it can get even worse when people tell you you're wonderful because then you're shining and without and without really piece, you know, parsing it and figuring out how to um, dismantle that reaction, it's going to be a conflict. Like, wait mm -hmm. a minute, I'm not supposed to be wonderful. Don't tell me I'm wonderful. That just makes it worse, right? So, so to, to, um, to reframe that, 
to dissolve the energy of that re reaction, which is what I, you know, I think what I bring to things is to get to the point where that, that old taboo about uh, bragging on yourself no longer has any juice to it. Mm -hmm. It just no, no longer has any meaning to it. So of course you just say thank you and go on, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Marty, in terms of uh, people working with you, how are mm -hmm. folks able to get in touch with you and, and what sort of services do you offer? Is it individual? Is it group coaching? You know, the thing I want people to know about the most is the rapid relief from stress and distress class, which is a, a two and a half hour free class where I teach these techniques, uh, regardless of whether it's about performing or stage fright or anything like that. Uh, and they can go to rapidrelief.com, R-A-P-I-D-R-E-L-I-E-F.com and find out about that class. And if they want to look into private coaching or get my book or there's an online course, uh, then stagefright.com is where to go. Either one of those places, though, will take them there. And if, if they go to stagefright.com, then there's a drop down that will take them also to that free class. Love all the connections. So it's easy for folks to, to access one or the other. And mm -hmm. guys, she's offering the rapid relief uh, from stress and distress for free. Like that is amazing. If you're, if anything resonates with you, what you've heard here, this stuff is applicable to any area of your life. So definitely take advantage and use this free resource. And if you need additional coaching, whether it's private coaching or even her book, there's so many resources that she has available for you to take advantage of. Thank you. That's very nice of you to put it that way. <laughs> Actually, I started, well, I started teaching the rapid relief from stress and distress class for free, uh, what, a year and a half ago when COVID came up because we were all ah. so, you know, stressed and distressed about everything that that meant for us and still does. Uh, but it, but the things that people bring to work on as a class are not necessarily related to COVID and not mm -hmm. necessarily related to stage fright. It can be anything. It could be relationship stress or something that just happened or something that happened years ago or something you're anticipating, anything that you want to feel better about. Well, that's also great that you created this. You're sharing this, you know, with everyone out there, they can apply to any area of their life. And on top of that, it's a free resource. So definitely take advantage guys. And we're going to put all the information on how to connect with her all about her book, the various sites uh, in the YouTube details and the podcast details. Marty, any last thoughts that you want to share with the audience? Nope. I am so grateful to be here and share my ideas and share this resource with you and all of your listeners. And I, I just thank you so much. Thank you as well. I'm so glad to have had you on the podcast. I learned definitely. Uh, the conversation was definitely interesting. And I'm going to go check out that free resource because again, I still experience, you know, some nervousness, some, some fear at times and, and that freeze response, depending on what the engagement is. Absolutely. I invite you. That's wonderful. I'd love to see you. Yes. All right, guys. So like I always say, preparation, accountability, execution, and resolve are keys to your success. Until next time.